Easter morning as we gather together to worship our risen Savior. Let me draw your attention to the announcements in the bulletin. We'll come to our time of worship. Again, we'll observe the Lord's table during our morning service today, so you should have received uh, the elements when you came in. If not, EL can get them to you. And then we will not gather this evening for our service. We'll meet again uh, this coming Lord's Day. On the next Lord's Day, April 11th, we have our monthly meetings for the deacons and the elders. So those are the separate meetings, but those will both be at 5 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. And remember, we are also continuing to take nominations for the office of deacon. So if you'd like to nominate a male member of our congregation for that office, uh, then you can do so this Sunday or next. And then lastly, as you go out today, there's a few things in the narthex that you can take with you. I've reprinted the prayer bulletins for April, put the uh, kids' bulletins back out there, and some of the other material that some of our children like to use uh, during the service. It's all there in the narthex. You're welcome to use it uh, on Sundays. As well as I put a printout on the annual compassion offering that our denomination holds each year around Easter time, a offering that goes towards different ministries of mercy, helping those in need. So if you'd like to take a flyer and read about it and send in a gift, then those are there for you. All right, well, give your attention now to the front of our bulletin. I will read 1 Corinthians 15 as God calls us to worship. And notice at the end of the reading, the response from the congregation. I'll try to give you a heads up each time that we're doing that today as we get back into that rhythm. And you'll notice that one comes at the end of this first reading. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, by which you received, or which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Last of all, he appeared to me also, as the one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believe. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Come, let us worship the Lord. Let us pray. And at the end of my prayer, let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your mercies towards us. Thank you that we can gather today in Jesus' name to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Thank you that we celebrate that every Sunday when we gather on that day to worship instead of on Saturday. It is your proclamation that Christ has been raised from the dead. May we remember that all year round. Thank you for this special time of celebration, this extra focus on that key event, the resurrection of Christ, that provides our salvation, that accomplishes it, that makes it possible, that, that effectively brings it about that we can be declared righteous because of the work of the Son of God. So as we worship you this morning, Lord, make great your name. Forgive us of our sins that keep us from your presence. Cleanse us and receive us into your presence. Knit us together in love and unity to, with one voice today, proclaim the resurrection. And may Christ be precious to us. May he be adored and magnified. May he be glorified. Would you receive praise for yourself today? Would you make great your name? And we pray these things to you because we come to you praying as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power.
power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, take your hymnal. Let's sing hymn 277. Christ the Lord is risen today. We'll keep our seats while we sing. And let's, read the, let's sing the first, third, and fourth verse. Skip the second. Sing the first, third, and fourth hymn 277. Christ the Lord is risen today. scripture reading this morning comes from uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. You can look at it in your bulletin or in your Bible, but I will be reading from the New King James Version. John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their homes own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said to her, 
Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Psalm 16, a copy of God's Word, Psalm 16. Read this psalm for our consideration this morning and pray for our congregation. Psalm 16, and of course, give your attention again in the bulletin to the response after the reading of the Word by the congregation. Read Psalm 16 and then we'll give that response. <laughs> give our attention now to the reading of God's word. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, again, as we have your word open before us, and our desire is to hear you speak to us through it, to give us greater understanding of your word, to shape our hearts so that we obey your word and rejoice in it. I pray you would do that work for all of us this morning by the work of your spirit. And Father, as we Come to your word, we would also be mindful of those in our church that have needs that need you, the good shepherd, to attend to them. You continue to pray for Ronnie Hughes that he'd make this recovery from this issue with his heart and the care he's been getting there. Be with his family, make them to know your love. Be with our brother Jim Howell this morning, dealing with some vertigo, and may that pass quickly. May he be able to praise you even in uh, waiting through this season. Lord, we think of those who are 
ministering the gospel. We thank you that today we gather to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Lord, we weren't able to do this a year ago, but we're here today praising your name. And for that, we give you our sincere thanks. So we pray you would enlarge the ministries of this church, of Roba. Guide us through each decision, each day, each week. Thank you for your faithfulness over the years. And remember those other ministers that are working to advance your kingdom. So we think of uh, Mowrich Bezaden, who, who's moved over to Albania to serve with Bertie Kona in that church, one of our Calvary candidates. I pray you bless him and his family as they settle in, adjust to a new culture, as they form relationships, as they seek to raise their children, still a family. And therefore, as parents, they have that duty before you give them wisdom as they do that. Provide especially for the, the medical needs they have, their daughter's need of certain medicines. Please provide for that. Thank you that they are able to get three-month supply before they went, and help him especially to know, all of them to know how they can settle into the church and minister and serve well. We pray this th same thing for Mark Ashbaugh over on the Winthrop campus, and Richard Thomas just down the road with Dave Sanders there at Mount Calvary, that these ministries would know the blessing of God, that you'd keep them safe as they gather, that the word would do its great work, that people would be saved in our communities, that Christians would grow in the virtues that you set before us in your word as ways to cultivate the life of the spirit. And as those, we think of those far afield as well, Tom and Lucy Wright serving over in Africa, trying to take these trips and, and minister if they're hindered, trying to use their time well. And then even Christians in a faraway place like Ethiopia. Many can worship freely and openly. Thank you that you've given them that privilege as you have to us as well. So I pray then that you would help them to be faithful, to use those opportunities well. They would resist pressure from uh, those who convert, say, from an Islamic family to return to that, or the established church that doesn't support uh, the evangelical witness. I pray that the word of God would thrive in that country and many would be saved and those Christians would be strong in the face of their challenges. And that we would do so as well when we face the challenges your providence brings us, that we would respond on the basis of your word, and you give us great wisdom in that area. So again, as we come now to your word, Lord, open our eyes, bless this time for the glory of God and the good of our souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Throughout the middle of the 1800s, America experienced a time of great westward expansion. You probably studied this in history at some point. It started with the Louisiana Purchase, and of course is fueled by the gold rush, people wanting to go to California and discover wealth. And the way most people traveled in that day was in wagon trains over overland trails, such as the Oregon Trail. So the well-known uh, ancient game there patterned after a real thing, the Oregon Trail that took people west to California. And if you think taking a car ride is long these days, it might take four to six months to travel back in the 1800s. And one common trail was called the California Trail. That was a common route you might take. But in 1846, a guy named Lansford Hastings proposed an alternative route. It was known as the Hastings, Hastings Cutoff. It would save you time, maybe a month, on your travels to California. He described it as the most direct route, though it involved leaving the well-known route and going an alternate path. Well, there was one such party that attempted to use the quicker route. It was the infamous Donner Party. And unfortunately, a series of obstacles that they encountered along the way delayed their progress by about a month. <laughs> And they arrived at Donner Pass, later named for them, as an early winter storm rendered it impassable. And after becoming snowbound in the Sierra Nevada, many died of starvation, and the rest survived. Well, let me not go there. What should have been a direct route for the Donner Party turned out to be a way of doom for most of the party. Now, I freely admit, that's an awful story to tell, isn't it, on Easter morning? But it sets the passage well, this common theme we've been seeing in the Psalms of a right path and a wrong path. 
In Psalm 16, verse 11, we read the phrase, the path of life. The author of this psalm celebrates that God will make known to him this path of life and fill him with joy in God's presence. What is that path of life? How do we find it? As we go through this psalm, we'll see Psalm 16 celebrates many aspects of what we call the good life, the right pathway that re leads to the right end. And what you'll find in this life is there's many wrong pathways to the good life. There's many versions of the good life people will try to sell you, and there's many paths that they'll try to get you on in order to have you pursue that goal. But like the Donner Party, it won't get you where you want to go. Psalm 16 tells us once again what the good life is and how we find it. And furthermore, today is Easter Sunday. Psalm 16 is cited in the New Testament with reference to Jesus' resurrection. So as we celebrate the resurrection today, as we celebrate the path that Jesus walked to obtain our life, it will be good for us to consider what pathway we are on and where does that pathway ultimately lead. When you look at your life, is the path you're on leading to the world to come? Is the path you're on providing for your ultimate well-being, that of your soul, not just your current life? On this Easter morning, let's answer the question from Psalm 16, which pathway leads to the good life. Now here's how I want to develop this idea. In order to understand and apply this psalm, we need to look at it from a couple different points of view. So you'll notice the inscription of the psalm ascribes it to David. And so we'll look at it as David would have viewed it, as, as David penned this psalm, as he lived out this psalm in his life. What did that look like? But as I've already indicated, it's cited in the New Testament. Peter appeals to this text on the day of Pentecost, and he says, look, ultimately, David was looking ahead to Christ. So how might the psalm is figured into Christ's life, and of course, how does it figure into ours? All those perspectives together will tell us how to find the pathway that leads to the good life. So here's the first perspective. David shows you the benefits of the good life. If you want to know, what's this good life? What are the benefits of living it? David shows you in this psalm. So I want to use the first idea to get a sense of the psalm as a whole. We'll run through it in order to get the big idea. Now, verse 1 sets the stage for us, which says, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. This is the main idea of the psalm. The safety, the refuge that David finds in the Lord. And I know it's worded as a request, keep me safe, God, but as you'll see from the bulk of the psalm, it is really more an expression of the trust he has in God to be his refuge. So notice already the second phrase of verse 1, for in you I take refuge. Keep me safe, God. Why? Because you are the one I seek for my refuge. And I'm going to go on in this psalm, David says, to explain why that is, how I seek you and what the benefits of that are. And, and when he says, keep me safe or in you, you know, you're my refuge, don't just think merely, you know, he keeps me physically safe. There's been tons of conversation about that over the past year. You know, his goal here is God, ultimately, all my well-being comes from you. Not just physical safety, God is his strong tower that the righteous hide in and are saved. So it's really an expression of, God, I commit my whole well-being, body and soul, everything to you. Now, how does David do that and what are the benefits of it? Three ideas emerge from the psalm. First, David wants God to protect him from going after idols. So verse 2 reads, I say to the Lord... You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Notice the use of the divine names there. I say to the Lord, all caps, Yahweh, the covenant name for God, the Savior. I say to my Savior, you are my 
Lord, regular letters there, Adon, or Master. So Yahweh, the one true God, the, the God who revealed himself as the saving God, you, Yahweh, you are my master. You're the one true God, and I serve you. And because I serve you, apart from you, I have no good thing. All the good things in life, all the things I need, they all come from you. This is really an expression of David's resolve to keep the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. God, you alone, you will be my satisfaction, the good things. I'm only going to get them from you. You will be my security. You will be my commander. You will be my salvation. Now, because David identifies God as his Lord, he therefore also identifies with God's people. So verse 3 reads, I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. I love the NLT here. It reads, the godly people in the land are my true heroes. Whom does David admire? With whom does he want to associate? The company of the fellow faithful Yahweh worshipers. That is David's community. Those are his people. And because he associates with the faithful, he, verse 4 now, does not participate in idolatry. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Here we see kind of the big idea of the Psalter, don't we? There's two groups of people in David's mind. They're going in two separate directions. He knows which group he wants to run with. There are certainly echoes here of Psalm 1, the blessed one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but rather his delight is in the law of the Lord. And there's that word again, that the people are my delight, the law of the Lord is my delight. So because God has made his refuge, big idea, because God is his sole delight, he enjoys a delightful place among God's people and safety from idolatry and its deadly in, uh, outcome. Maybe we could say here, God keeps David safe from the devil. So how else does God or David made God his refuge. Second idea, verse 5. He says, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Now, when you hear that word portion, I want you to think of what you know from the Old Testament about Israel's land. That word portion, you use that to describe your allotted inheritance. The land you were given in ancient Israel. All sorts of spiritual meanings there but also a very basic meaning. Law was your means of survival. Law was, or excuse me, land was your income in the ancient world. That's why the Levites were supported by the people. They had no land. You needed land to live in the ancient world. And David says, but you know what, God? Ultimately, you are my portion. You are my lot. It's almost like Almost like David speaking like a Levite here. I don't have any land, God, but I've got you. You are the source of security and prosperity in my life. So then verse 6 gives the benefits. The boundary lines, land, have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Again, language of uh, property and inheritance. How is the land measured out? to the tribes and the families in the ancient Israel. Well, David says, my boundary lines, they've fallen just right. My property lines put me in a pleasant place. Why? Because he's identified God as his inheritance. And it's not just, okay, God, I acknowledged you, and then you gave me good stuff. It's, God, the stuff doesn't matter. Because I have you. You're my beautiful tract of land that I received by inheritance. And how does he get it? How, how has David made God his portion? Verse 7, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. David has submitted himself to God's instructions. Again, Psalm 1, he delights 
in the law of the Lord. That's what it means to make the Lord your refuge, your master, and your lot. One study Bible notes, seeking God's protection presupposes and even demonstrates the subject's loyalty to the Lord. In the Psalms, those who take shelter in the Lord are contrasted with the wicked and equated with those who love, fear, and serve the Lord. That's why verse 8 goes on to say, I keep my eyes always on the Lord, and therefore I will not be shaken. So this is just another way of David saying, you're my God, I listen to you, I follow you, and therefore I have this inheritance. So maybe we could say here, God keeps David safe from destitution. Then at the end of the psalm, one more benefit that comes to those who make God their refuge. Verses 9 through 11 read, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Essentially because David has committed his life and his soul to God, God rescues him from death. God will be the one to ultimately take care of David's life. His body will rest secure. God will not abandon him to the grave and the realm of the dead. Rather, God will make known to him the path of life. So that's the first perspective I want you to see. I want you to see the benefits that the psalm offers, what the good life is offered, what good life God offers to his people. Safety from the devil, his lies, his false gods, Safety from destitution. Why? Because you have God. And if you have him, you have all you need. And three, safety from death. Because God will lead you to the path of life. So those are the benefits. So with that sense of the psalm as a whole in mind, now I want you to look at it from a second point of view. And it's this. Israel warns you of the consequences of shunning the good life while offering the hope of forgiveness. So again, the inscription ascribes this psalm to David. When you read those Old Testament books for, for a good period of time, you see him, you see many people in Israel, enjoying benefits like this. But how might an Israelite living in the exile have read this psalm? How might an Israelite back home with a destroyed Canaan, no king on the throne, how might he have read the psalm? How do you and me as the people of God, how do we read this psalm? I think it would have made their hearts ache knowing they had lost these kinds of blessings through their sin. And I think it would have comforted them knowing that God was acting to forgive them. Let me show you why that is. Let's run one more time through the major sections of the psalm. Verse 1 says, commit your soul to God. So verse 2 comes and says, all right, you should make God alone your God. You should keep his commandments. And when you do, verse 3, you will participate in the community of God's people. You will not be surrounded by idolaters. That's what the psalm offers you. But where did Israel find herself in exile? In the midst of idolatrous tormentors. Remember what Psalm 137 says? By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our hearts. We put our instruments away. For how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Israel was removed from the worship and the delight that characterized their existence in the promised land. And why? Because of idolatry. Because they worshiped other gods. They didn't do what David instructed them to do here in Psalm 16. They broke God's commandments. They trusted something other than God to take care of them. Now, how might those memories have assured them then of God's forgiveness? 
Well, most students of the Bible agree if there was one problem the exile solved for Israel, it was the problem of idolatry. So when Israel returned back home to the land, you don't see them committing idolatry. Now we could talk about, they had other problems. We could talk about idols of the heart, but you don't read in those books about Israel bowing down to statues and worshiping something other than Yahweh. The exile cured that. And so what does it show us? It shows us God does not throw us away when we sin. If you find yourself far from home, overrun by idols, your life is not going the way you wanted because of bad decisions, because you don't know God, the promise is you can turn off that path at any moment. It may be a thousand steps away, it's one step back. And God will forgive, and God will cleanse, and he will change you so that you are no longer enslaved to those things. You can actually come to enjoy the blessings of this psalm. The life you're living now doesn't have to be the life you always live. Second section then of Psalm 16. David celebrates what? His inheritance in the Lord. Better than his physical inheritance of land is his ultimate safety in the Lord. Well, because Israel did not listen to God's counsel, because they did not keep their eyes always on him, they were removed from their land. And their whole world was shaken when God took them out of their land and put them in exile in Babylon. So they would have read that saying, oh, we lost out on the physical kind of inheritance at least, but how would the psalm have communicated forgiveness? Well, first, God eventually brought them back to their land as an expression of his forgiveness. And not only that, but David's words show Israel, ultimately, you can have security in God even when you are not in the promised land. See, David got that. He realized this whole promised land, it's pointing to something else. There is an ultimate security that I have in the Lord, even if I don't have my physical land. God didn't tie his provision or his protection to any one place. It could be enjoyed anywhere under any circumstances. And Israel might learn that lesson when they were removed from the things they enjoyed so much. Maybe it would show them what they actually need is something else. They need the thing that those things point towards the living God himself. And third, then, finally, David celebrates, God will deliver me from death. But many people died when Israel went into exile. In fact, you know that verse we cite a lot at Christmas because it's in the Matthew story? Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It's from Jeremiah. In the background is the exile. Because the Israelites, as they're led away into Babylon, Rachel, the mother of Israel, is personified as weeping over the death and the destruction that have come to her children. So where's the message of forgiveness? Well, when the Bible talks about Israel going back home, because God promised them, they would return to their land. It does so using the language of resurrection from the dead. Israel going home will be like Israel coming back to life again. And that, by the way, is the clue that tells us exactly where this psalm is going in its ultimate meaning. And for us, although Israel found itself beyond the reach of God's mercy, God would reclaim them. And God would restore them to their land. They weren't beyond the reach of God's mercy. They'd have new life and hope. So ask yourself, where do you find yourself in this psalm? Have you committed your soul to God? Or are you trying to make your own way through life? Is serving God and finding joy in him, is that what gets you up in the morning? Is that what gives you pleasure throughout your day? Or do you try to obtain good apart from him? This is what I want. I don't need God to get there. Maybe even your own definition of good. This is what the kind of life I want to live. It doesn't match up with God's definition of the good life. Do you find, do you have real security? Do you have real satisfaction in your soul? 
Because you'll only find it in God alone. Do you delight in identifying with his people? Or are you running after the false gods and lies of the world? Do you know the joy of forgiveness? And do you have true hope for life beyond this life? This psalm shows us those benefits. They can be known. They can be enjoyed in this life. They can be obtained even by those who disobey God. In fact, they're only obtained by those who disobey God. Because that's all of us. They're obtained when we run to God in forgiveness. And that brings me to the third and final point of view. Which is that Jesus fulfills for you. The requirements of the good life. So 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, 10 days after he ascended into heaven on Pentecost Sunday, Peter, or on Pentecost, Peter preached from the following passage. I'll read it to you. You tell me if it sounds familiar. This is from Acts 2. This is Peter's passage. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you fill me with joy in your presence. You recognize that? Psalm 16 is our psalm today. So listen to Peter's sermon. Listen to his comment on this text. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Peter is basically saying, maybe with a chuckle, David knew that he wasn't the ultimate fulfillment of this psalm. Now, yes, David trusted God. He trusted God would keep him safe. He trusted God would deliver him from death. That is, his enemies wouldn't triumph over him and bring him to an untimely death. But you know what else David knew? He knew God had promised him, David, one of your descendants is going to sit on Israel's throne forever. He's going to reign over God's people forever. He will never stop reigning and living. And friends, there's only one way for that to come to pass. And David put those dots together for God himself to sit on Israel's throne. For God himself to take on human flesh. Because remember, David knows it's going to be my son, and yet he's going to sit on the throne forever. And as we read in the Gospels, that God-man would live, die, and rise again, and then be enthroned for us and in our place. This is what Jesus does. He submits to death at the hands of his enemies. He trusts that God will raise him from the dead. And and please don't miss that point. How could Jesus go to death knowing that God would deliver him? Because he knew Psalm 16. He believed Psalm 16. He knew that ultimately it was talking about him. And he knew God has made me promises. If I make God my refuge, he will deliver me. From the devil, and he will deliver me from destitution. I'll have a true inheritance beyond this life, and he will deliver me from death. I won't stay in the grave. My body won't decay. God will restore me to the path of life. And that's why Jesus can say on the cross in one moment, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Bearing sin. And then in a later breath, say triumphantly, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus has paid it all and done everything that must be done in order for you to be forgiven and for you to enjoy the good life, the 
Therefore, if you want to live the good life, follow the path Jesus walked. The pathway that leads to the good life is the one Jesus first walked for you. By our disobedience and idolatry, death entered God's creation. Jesus went to the cross confidently, knowing that through his death and resurrection, God would begin the new creation. He would give resurrection life to those who trust in him. Now, we can know that if we trust God and if we obey him, we have eternal life. No matter what life brings you, following Jesus is the way to life. He proves that by going ahead of you, blazing a trail that you can follow. So you rest in it on one hand, and on the other hand, you run down that path, and you follow him as well. It may still be difficult at times. It may be scary at times. My children have told me what it's like. Uh, doing tornado drills at school. And even one time a few years ago, there was a real uh, tornado warning. You, you, you get in a safe position. But it doesn't mean you're not nervous. You're waiting for the storm to pass. The, the goal of the shelter is to keep you safe. You will never find a safer refuge in life than the Lord Jesus Christ. The world may tell you, identifying with God's people, that is a waste of time. Those people, they're just bigots, they're just hypocrites, they're really just in it for something else. Don't waste your time. The Bible warns you the way of idolatry leads to death. The world may tell you, you need money, you need power. Maybe figure the spiritual stuff out later when you're secure. You need right now security in the Lord Jesus Christ. And your ultimate satisfaction will never be found in anything in this life. And lastly, the world may tell you, you know, you've got nothing to fear from death. You're smart and figure it out. You can just cheat that and get through. Our ultimate safety from death is to be connected to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith so that we have the hope of heaven when we die and the hope of bodily resurrection when he comes again. And because of Easter, we have that hope. So let's give thanks and pray. And then we'll sing another resurrection hymn before we come to the Lord's table. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on his merits, on his authority. And we pray that you would forgive us of the sins that led to your death, our disobedience. You paid for with your voluntary death. And so we thank you for that. And we praise you for resurrection life. We praise you that God raised you from that, that you trusted, you obeyed, and now you've entered into that beautiful inheritance. We give you thanks for that. We praise your name. And I pray, Lord, we pray that we would live joyful lives because of Easter. That we would be loyal to you as David was. That we would find our lot in you. That we'd even live our lives and face our deaths as citizens of your kingdom. Give us that hope. Give us that trust. Give us that obedience that flows from that confidence. And we give you our thanks and our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's sing hymn 274. Thine be the glory. Again, you can keep your seat. We'll sing the first two verses. Verses 1 and 2, hymn 274. Thine be the Lord.
read these words of institution from Mark's Gospel, Mark 14, beginning at verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Notice here as Jesus celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples, he takes those Passover elements and gives them a new meaning. This bread and wine that symbolized Israel's salvation from Egypt, from slavery, very powerful imagery for them and us, now takes on an additional meaning. It will ultimately be brought about, how? By the Lamb of God, who gives his body and his blood for our salvation. All that disobedience we talked about this morning, all that exile and removal from God's presence, it is restored, it is forgiven, it is fixed, how? by the faithful Son of God. And so we have the privilege this morning on Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection to actually commune with our Lord. He says, I won't eat or I look forward to it. I won't drink the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Probably looking forward ultimately to when he comes again. We have that great feast. Yeah, what do we also read then in Paul's letters? Right now, When you take this bread, when you drink this cup, you have fellowship with Christ's body and blood. So we're going to start the feast now, but we're reminded because we don't see him. There's still a great feast to come. So I want to give thanks for that. We invite you if you are a believer and if you are a member of a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church, We invite you to celebrate the Lord's table with us. This is the Lord's table, not just Roebuck Church's table. But if you're not a Christian, please hold off. If you've not had your profession of faith heard and accredited by elders and a a Bible-believing church, then hold off. If If you're under discipline from our church or any other church, hold off. Again, we say that for your good, as Paul warns about those who would eat and drink in an unworthy manner, those who don't know the Lord or aren't following him in obedience. Now, maybe you hear that and you think, well, I'm far from perfect, but what do you do with your imperfection? Do you take it to the cross and seek God's forgiveness? Then you need this to strengthen your soul. And so come and eat and drink. Let me give thanks, and then we'll partake of the elements. Father in heaven, again, you have given us this bread from the earth. You have given us this fruit of the vine. And as it nourishes our bodies only a little bit, So we are pointed to what we ultimately need nourishment for, the well-being of our souls and the cleansing of our sins by Christ's blood. So we dedicate these elements to you for this holy purpose and pray as, as we eat and drink that we would do so with faith and that we would commune with you and we would make our souls strong. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can take your element here and open it on the bottom, the bread side. You've probably done that already. And remove the wafer there. And as Jesus said, take it, this is my body. Let's do this, eat this in remembrance of him. And in the same manner, he took the cup. Kind of open the top there. Again, very much when we eat the Lord's table, we are communing with the Lord. We are also communing with one another. This is the fellowship meal we eat together as believers. So Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant, so do this in remembrance of me. And as often as we eat that bread and drink that cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me give thanks once again, and then we'll receive the benediction. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus Christ who lives again. Thank you for fellowship with him now. Imperfect fellowship. We don't see you yet. And yet you communicate to us the grace, the strength we need to live by faith. So as we go out, Lord, I pray we'd be a a joyful, celebrating people this Sunday and throughout the whole year. 
And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you'd like to lift up your hands, lift up your eyes, hear and receive God's blessing. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. all for joining us. So God bless you. Happy Easter.